Holy moly, incoming duck, everybody. Yeah, right, there is an asteroid about to hit the Earth there. And welcome, everybody. I'm Mark Marquette, and we're so glad that you're with us today for some backyard astronomy on Stay Star Curious. And we got back in our Streamlabs uh, helm here, Marty Winkle's back in town. Thank you, Marty, for being here. He had a little break and saw some friends on a vacation, and Selvin Trotter filled in amiably there, but good to have Marty back. Today we're going to talk about asteroids. Asteroid Day is officially Friday, July, June 30th, and there's going to be celebrations in Luxembourg on the 8th Annual Astronomy Day. And uh, who started this and why is it continuing? Well, we'll tell you all about that. Yeah, you can see a few asteroids from your backyard, so, uh, two of the three or four bigger ones that are in stable orbits between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter. Vesta and Cirrus are the two that you're likely to see, but they look like a, just a faint star even in binoculars. But uh, what we're going to talk about today is how uh, over 2,000 potentially hazardous asteroids are tracked uh, around our the world and uh, the uh, and also the fact that if it's not the case of if but when the next catastrophe is going to happen and I'm going to show you about 30 lucky misses in the last 10 years uh, or last decade actually that uh, if they'd hit over a city or something there could have been some serious uh, problems and uh, different asteroids we're going to talk about and uh, have a good time uh, trying to figure out if a potentially hazardous asteroid was heading to Earth, like this one behind me, would we be able to do something about it? The answer is stay curious. So, Marty, let's thank one of our sponsors, GoHistoryTravel.org, has made a significant donation. And I just found out today from our IT guy, Bruce Jacobs, and Executive Director Karen Conklin, that a big investment has been made to get us a laptop that we can use and go out on the road more. We being Marty and I, as we bring you Stay Curious. So thank you. We're looking forward to that, uh, getting out and seeing uh, some of our sponsor friends and some of the sites around the Tri-Cities get back out to Space View Park that we used to do quite a bit. But um, uh, so thank you for your donation there. Go History Travel. Uh, Dave Stangy also uh, put some of your money towards some of that new equipment we're going to be getting. And anyone else that wants to help us, our beautiful nonprofit, just go up at the top of our website and you can donate any number of ways to help our beautiful and important U.S. Space Walk of Fame Foundation that for over 22 years has been providing a museum where you can see relics from the space age right here in its delivery room, Brevard County. Well, stargazer Mark today, I was looking out last night before, uh, at the moon uh, and I was... Uh, eating a hamburger that had a big old slice of Adelia onions on there, Marty. Thank you to uh, Gary and uh, his wife, Donnie, uh, from Collins, Georgia, and uh, one of our uh, fabulous uh, watchers on our program here. Uh, Gary, thank you for uh, uh, Gary Gerald. His last name's Gerald. We called him the peanut farmer, but he said, Mark, we raise 70% of what we raise are Vidalia onions. We're one of 17 counties in Georgia that can do that. And he works for a great op big operation there. Some of the fattest Vidalias I've ever seen, and they are delicious. Gary, thank you very much. I hope you and your wife, Donnie, had a great trip back home. And next time, I sit, they'll be down here in August. But Marty, I promised uh, they showed me a, a, a quicker way and maybe even more leisurely way to get back up to Tennessee to see my daughter and granddaughter. So I may be bunking with them some night there. So a, a great couple there and a great supporter, Gary Gerald. Thank you for watching Stay Curious and your onions there. Well, last month, last week, actually, on, on Backyard Astronomy, we talked about the days of the moon's age. And if zero is new moon, Seven, and there's a 28-day cycle that astronomers use. Well, tonight is a first quarter moon, which will be seven days old. 
full moon is 14 days old. Third or last quarter is 21 days old, and then back to zero days for the new moon. But this beautiful picture by Les Brooks in Durham, UK, uh, taken last night, and I was looking at the same moon. And along that terminator, the area between night and day, that's the area of the terminator, about there in the middle was a crater that was just starting to get sunlight in a gigantic mountain peaks were throwing a shadow on the floor of this and it's after a uh, uh and it was on this crater right here i sketched it ridge of montanus all right and i've encouraged people to every no one owns the moon so you can do anything you want with it and when i looked at this through my kind of small telescope like a six inch reflector i was stunned that along the horizon and the terminator just to the right this this crater was catching light. The crater on the right is already partially illuminated. Webster is the name of that crater. And you see the mountain peaks, Marty, that are on the, the crater wall are stretching across the floor of this crater region mountainous. So just, I'm not going to say this is an artistic work of, of art, uh, but it's what I did in my moment of being thrilled by seeing something on the moon that I often did not see. This kind of took me back. I thought there was a reflection in uh, my eyepiece there uh, because I'm in my backyard and there's a lot of city lights around me. But no, it was this pattern that was being created in the dark area of the moon at the Terminator as the mountain peaks on the left side or, or west are, are hitting, just catching sunlight, and the ones on the east side are throwing this shadow on the, the uh, floor of this crater that's about uh, 40 miles in diameter, pretty big crater. A lot of the, the bigger craters you see on the moon are around 50 uh, to, uh, to 40 miles in diameter. So that's to inspire you to get out and do something with the moon tonight, whether it's with a, a photo, a poem, uh, or a sketch like I did of one crater last night. Well, what we're looking at here is some electric light in the sky over Seattle, Washington last night. And this display was taken by Dustin Guy. I post, I took this off of uh, spaceweather.com, which is I, uh, one of my, well, it's my home page, and it always has a photo of the sun and all the uh, sunspots on it, and then some outstanding uh, usually a landscape type of photo. Uh, that's why I like space weather a lot, is because you see landscape photos of astronomical phenomenon that we can all see with our eyes. Well, what's going on here, Marty? These are called noctulescent clouds, or NLCs. Noctulescent clouds are, believe it or not, frosted meteor smoke. That's what you're seeing here. You're seeing high up, uh, over 80 kilometers, all right, almost 50 miles high in the sky, water crystallizes around disintegrated meteoroids. These are meteors that meteoroids that uh, uh, burn up in the Earth's atmosphere and don't reach the and the the surface, and they their smoky trails of them disintegrating linger in this super cold layer of the Earth, and usually we see them between the latitudes, the higher, higher up latitudes, like uh, Canada, England, and so forth. But uh, uh, a NOAA weather satellite is monitoring these from orbit, and over the weekend it detected clouds between the 40 and 60 degrees latitude. Uh, that's pretty far uh, south. Uh, and ground-based observers are seeing them even spreading further south. This is a normal development at the beginning of each summer. Noctulescent clouds tend to be concentrated inside the Arctic Circle. As June turns to July, the clouds spread to lower latitudes. They've been sighted in recent years as far south as Spain and Southern California. All right, so Doug Forrest, keep your eyes open there. He's one of our followers there in Los Angeles area. Uh, go outside then at sunset. Look to the north. These were about an hour and a half after sunset, said Dustin Guy. Uh, and uh, you might see these electric blue ripples rising in the night sky. And if you do, you are seeing smoke from meteors that have ice crystals around them. How cool is that?
Well, Marty, we got a launch. Uh, we're going to talk about inter. We got. We do have a launch. We're going to talk about International Asteroid Day here. Is officially on June thirtieth. Why is it June thirtieth? And who started this whole thing eight years ago? Well, that'd be Brian May, the rock guitarist for the group Queen. He's a very serious, uh, serious professional astronomer, doctor of astronomy. Brian May uh, has got uh, created this asteroid day with another forward-thinking person, Rusty Schweikert of Apollo 9, an asteroid day co-founder. And he's always out there talking about there's no accepted global policy on what to do about asteroid impacts. If we saw something out there heading to Earth, how are we going to deflect it? What are we going to do to stop it? And this is all part of asteroid day to bring an awareness of what we can do and what we can't do if we are facing a doomsday type of scenario and of course hollywood has already sees this with some blockbuster movies of course and some impossible heroics to save us but we're going to find out what nasa did do that was kind of heroic to change the orbit of a very small uh, asteroid one that's actually orbiting another asteroid so before we get to that marty we're going to have a launch Saturday at 11, 11 uh, uh, thereabouts in the morning. Uh, that is going to launch this satellite. The Euclid is what they call this after the famous Greek uh, uh, geometer of old, uh, 2,000 years ago. SpaceX will launch the Euclid mission for ESA. It is an astrophysics mission with a telescope and two scientific instruments designed to explore the evolution of the universe more importantly, find dark matter. Dark matter is an incredible unknown in our solar system. Here's the launch uh, parameters for Euclid. Uh, it is, uh, like I said, they're going to make a 3D map of the universe by observing billions of galaxies out to 10 billion light years away. And we think the Big Bang started about 15 billion light years ago. So this is going to be at the edge of the known visible universe. And uh, Euclid's got the typical, uh, it's got a sun shield on it there. It's got a star tracker. All these uh, spacecraft need star trackers to orient them. And it's got thrusters. It's going to move it and orient it in different uh, directions and keep it in a stable orbit. So... This was going to be launched uh, by a Soyuz rocket uh, earlier in the year, but because of the Ukraine invasion by Russia, uh, ESA took their business elsewhere. There is uh, Euclid being tested out in its white room there. And um, this is a, a class of missions uh, that the uh, uh, Europe has been involved in, including its solar orbiter. And as part of their cosmic vision campaign, ESA has to understand our solar system. Now, I'd mentioned black or dark matter. If all these galaxies and planets and so forth you see in pictures, all right, all of these wonderful things we know about our universe right now, of all the stars and galaxies and so forth, incredibly, that is less than 10%, maybe 15%, of the entire visible universe and the gravitational attractions going on don't aren't explained for by the visible universe therefore there is an invisible element called dark matter that this spacecraft is going to investigate so uh, good luck to the launch of euclid marty i think i'll be out there watching space view park probably out there fun time out there with Ra ozzy uh, who does a good commentator commentating for our museum, our rocket hobo, Ozzy Osbourne. So we'll get him back on the show here soon. Well, we're talking about Asteroid Day. Can we defend our Earth from asteroids? Well, that is what this was all about. DART. DART was a double asteroid redirect test, all right? And DART is the spacecraft there, and it became a planetary defender in September 26, last year, 2022, when it did move this small size of the Giza pyramid. It moved it from the white orbit into the blue orbit that it is close to its parent asteroid, Didymus. Didymus 
uh, was a couple miles in diameter. Uh, dimorphous, like I said, the size of the pyramids of Giza, a couple th a thousand miles across. And the DART spacecraft at the bottom, direct or double asteroid redirection test, uh, had a a kind of a small CubeSat with it called Lycia from Italy that photographed the impact of DART into this. And the whole idea was DART was moving at 13,000 miles an hour and its impactor blasted into it in over a, 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 over a million pounds, 2.5 million pounds was lost by the asteroid by a small object uh, smacking into it. No, no pyrotechnics involved, no TNT or anything, just the flat out impact and it changed the orbit. Uh, although the collision was not destructive, it did turn Dimorphos into an active asteroid with a tail and comet, like a comet but without the sublimating ice. This was something very uh, strange to see. So here's the photographs by the uh, that little space probe called Lycia. All right, and uh, this is a, just a moment before the impact, and there is the impact on the upper there, the uh, the other uh, the larger. Um, uh, asteroid there in the foreground was untouched and here are two other a uh, panel of three pictures that the drone so to speak satellite took of this impact and then from uh, the hubble telescope uh, as it evolved around and moved around the solar system they saw a tail spring out from from this uh, very small asteroid but it was impacted all right but hour by hour debris and chunks were flying into space and DART, which was the size of a golf cart, all right, uh, that's what we're talking about here. A golf cart has just hit that pyramid, great pyramid-sized asteroid called Dimorphos. And uh, so as a result, Dimorphos is going around its parent 33 minutes faster than before. So proof that we can alter the path of a asteroid somewhat, all right, uh, with an impactor. So hazards by the numbers, just how important is this that we do this well? As this chart says, at the top, you got how big is it? And at the bottom, the pie chart is how many of them do we see uh, within uh, uh, several million miles of, of the Earth? Well, we know 100% the ones that are over 30,000 feet across or 10 meters, okay? And that's about five miles across. Uh, and ones that are about 100 meters or around a, a mile, about three quarters of a mile, actually, we know there's 900 of those uh, around us. And uh, but there's an unknown certainty of 5% of them. Then you get down to the small things under, let's say, 140 meters. All right. That's that's a little bit bigger than a football field. OK. Or a soccer pitch, if you will. So. We've got 25,000 objects, okay, that are uh, uh, one every 20,000 years, all right, has a chance to hit the Earth is what this is all about, all right. Then those that are 50 meters across, all right, or 150 feet across, there's 120,000 of those, you know, with a chance of hitting us once every 1,000 years. And then the small ones, all right, that are smaller than 10 meters. And you say, can we see things like that? We sure can. I'm going to give you a few examples here in a minute. Um, those that are under like 30 feet across, okay, uh, or a first 10 yards on a football field, there's 45 million of them, all right, in the Earth's vicinity. And that means that one per decade is the chances of being hit. And we've only discovered less than three tenths of those because they're so small. And those are three tenths of them are ones that we discover within days of them uh, possibly hitting the earth. So to launch something in days, uh-uh. We'd have to know months ahead of time to launch something to possibly save it. So this will get into having some sort of a, a nuclear tip scenario type of thing. Uh, and hitting them if something would be found 
Monday today that we know is going to hit the Earth Saturday and is big enough to cause some damage. Of course, where it's going to hit is another question. So, DART did exceed, uh, and uh, we're real happy about that. All right, let's ramp up here to International Day. Uh, I was wondering if our good friend Mark Usiak was going to Wallops Island as he watches launches up there and, and photographs them. But uh, there's really nothing locally here. This is the 8th Annual International uh, Asteroid Day, uh, founded uh, by Queen guitarist Brian May, uh, Danica, um, oh, what's Danica's last name there? Remy, Danica Remy is a co-founder of it, as is asteroid Rusty Schweikert and German filmmaker uh, Georgie Richards, uh, Rickers. Richters, uh, Richters is his name, Richters, Giorgio Richters. Asteroid Day supported uh, by the government of Luxembourg and international space agencies. And in 2016, the United Nations sanctioned it as an official day to increase uh, global awareness of asteroids, okay? And um, uh, our good friend Alex Carl, the ESA, uh, your Eurocom, he's involved with Asteroid Day. And I'm, we may try to effort him, though we've had a few little... Uh, here on Stay Curious, some uh, compromised, uh, uh, um, what I'm trying to say is we're not adept at doing Google Meets uh, like we were a few months ago or last year. We're, we we got to get up to speed with that again. But we're going to get you some European and inner uh, guests here on our show here in the next couple months, I promise you. Uh, Danica Remy, uh, we're going to see a picture of her here in a minute. She co-founded also B612, a foundation that is one of the leaders that uh, Schweikert is also part of in promoting asteroid awareness. Here are some people that have signed like an asteroid doctrine of saying that we need to have global awareness of this. you got a lot of actors there. Ryan Austin Kutcher and uh, Jack Black is, is in there. you got Whoopi Goldberg, uh, astronaut Terry Hadfield and Steve Smith are in there. Uh, so uh, a lot of people... Uh, you know, have found it in their heart to support this with, with their finances. And the festival is going to be in Luxembourg, Transchap, Luxembourg. Uh, they have European uh, astronauts there, uh, uh, and uh, no American astronauts are involved this year. It's the eighth year, and I hope it gets some momentum. Uh, and we're, that's what we're talking about here on Stay Curious. Go Google Asteroid Day. It'll take you to their website, and you can get the lineup and when they're going to be broadcasting things uh, over this weekend. And this is, again, why we're doing this. We were just talking about that chart. Is this re a real thing? Well, let's, how about this? On At the top of this chart, on June 20th, all right, last week, an asteroid named 20. 23 MB3. That means it was discovered in 2023, and it missed the Earth by 0.4 lunar distances. The lunar distance defined as a quarter million miles, 250,000 miles. So it missed us by 0.4, okay, lunar distance there, and uh, that is a uh, uh, wow, okay. Uh, that That's pretty doggone close. Uh, then you got some other values there. Uh, there are 2,227 potentially hazardous asteroids uh, uh, on there. So um, that's what that chart's all about. You want to look at the mist distance and the lunar diameter, right? Five lunar diameters on the 25th. Let's look today, the 27th. Uh, we've got the 26th. There was one in there, 14 lunar diameters. Okay, uh, and uh, no, the 26th there. Yeah, 14 lunar diameters. So that'd be about 3 million miles away. All right, and it's 98 meters in diameter, so pretty big. So uh, some of these are just 20 feet across. One of them, June 24th, uh, came halfway between the Earth and the moon, intercepting our our, our orbit and it just takes a little bit of a gravity oomph here and there to redirect those to right into big old mother earth so it's not a case of if it's when and here is just a chart showing you uh 30 of the closest asteroids and why how they're whizzing by earth 
Well, June 30th was chosen because this destruction happened in 1908 when up in Tunguska, Siberia, all right, a impactor affected this entire area. It was actually heard in Moscow and lights were seen at night burning as this was a night event and on the horizon all over anyone looking in that direction saw light up in the area and what happened was they think a comet didn't hit this impact it blew up before it hit but it was so big and had so much uh, energy uh, pushing ahead that the atmosphere ahead of it and so forth it's a tremendous amount of energy involved and when it blew up it devastated this whole area of Tunguska in 1908. Took uh, almost 10 years for scientists to reach this remote area. If this had happened in Moscow, all right, here's uh, it, it would be a very devastating uh, loss of lives or anywhere where there is Paris, London, anywhere. Uh, so very lucky near miss, all right, for humanity in 1908 because it would have caused some destruction. As it was, it did throw material up in the air and they had beautiful sunrises and sunsets uh, for uh, months on end as the debris from this and the fires swirled around the world. It did not leave a crater. That's why we know it probably blew up before it hit the earth. And uh, yet... This was a, what happened uh, up in uh, Russia uh, just about 10 years ago. Uh, we're going to see here just a minute where a, a uh, asteroid grazed the Earth, not hitting it, but grazed the atmosphere and went off. Still, parts of it were blown off and caused millions of dollars worth of damage up in uh, Chelinsk, uh, 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 Russia. Of course, the poor asteroids suffered that fate of 65 million years ago, these gigantic, enormous animals living on Earth just disappeared within a few hundred years. We're not even sure it could have even been quicker than that. And uh, why? Because a big impactor, maybe four miles across, hit where the Yucatan Peninsula is, the Gulf of Mexico. Didn't create the Gulf of Mexico. They think they found the crater underneath the, the water there, though. And uh, uh, they could... They could find this. They knew that something happened by what's called a, the KT layer. There's a layer of ashes and soot that had a certain characteristic when this asteroid hit of all the debris coming up. And as 65 million years ago, as layers and layers of, of dirt and humanity come on top of layers of dirt, you see this timeline there. So pretty good evidence that 65 million years ago, an impactor did wipe out the dinosaurs because it created a global um, scenario where the suit of the impact uh, put a canopy around the earth, all right, created a global cooling situation instead of warming, all right, because no sunlight could get in. And the cooling uh, was limited, uh, uh, the, the plants to grow, and so the ant that most of the dinosaurs died out because of the lack of food supply in those carnivorous ones, uh, uh, you know, were impacted in other ways in their food sources too. So uh, an incredible event that happened 65 million years ago. Yes, it could happen again. These are asteroids that had more than one kiloton all right, of energy, all right. That, that doesn't mean they have to be very big. A fist-sized meteoroid flowing through the space is called a meteoroid. When it goes into the Earth's atmosphere and burns up, it's a meteor when we see it. And when you pick it up off the floor, it's a meteorite, all right. Well, these are impacts like the, the Chelyabinsk up there in 2013 in Russia. That was over 20 tons, kilotons, 20,000 tons of impact there. And it blew out uh, glass windows, uh, set off alarms all over the place on cars by the just this energy coming down and, and the, the, the 
of this main impactor that did blow up some. There are pieces of it that you can buy online, I'm sure. Uh, but look at all these places. Over 30 places in a 10-year period, 20, uh, 2000 to 2013. Okay, so this is a 10-year-old chart. And, of course, you're going to have many incidences over the oceans and waterways of the earth because 70% of our world is water. So all kinds of things go unseen. But these are 30 different events in a 13-year period that any of them could have been uh, uh, a, a created a lot of dis destruction. As you see, look at America, Marty. Hardly any of them recorded in there. How lucky are we? Are we? If that Chelya Banks had happened over Kennedy Space Center or St. Louis or or Columbus, Ohio, or something, you'd have really had a, 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 a more damage. And if it had come straight down, that Chelya Banks up there in Russia, it hit at an angle, grazed us. All right. So Antarctica, another hotbed of impacts because. The iron in meteors, and they're mostly meteors, have metal in them, are drawn into the gravity poles of the Earth. So there's, hope I'm convincing you to be aware of Asteroid Day. Uh, there is Remy there, uh, uh, one of the ladies that founded this, and she's very involved with the, get, get my notes here, uh, with the uh, six, um, the B. 612 Foundation and Asteroid Institute. Uh, they bring together scientists, researchers, and engineers to develop tools and technologies to understand our solar system. All right. There's Rusty Schweikert. He's a big part of this also. Uh, we've got, hey, Keith Sewell's in Arkansas working his way back here, Marty. He, well, he made it all the way out to the West Coast. Uh, wishes he's probably out there to see those noctulescent clouds in Seattle. Uh, astronomer Keith Sewell is. John Claro. Hey, welcome to Stay Curious, John. And we got Cynthia Rossi and Melissa Pope and Dave Stangy uh, on board for a new week. Robert uh, Law is watching up in Dundee, Scotland. Hope you saw that moon up there that your neighbor took. Carlton Bailey's out there in, on, at, the, uh, at his hacienda. I hope you're doing well, Carlton. Bill Whiting is also back on the Space Course. Welcome back, Bill. Look forward to seeing you. Steve Hammer is watching Space Monkeys out there again. All right, Space Monkey. Let's look at uh, uh, Brian May there to remind you that, uh, you know, uh, he's a, a serious rock god, you ought to say, uh, with all those queen hits and his great guitar mastery. But he's a serious uh, astronomer that wants to bring his fame to bring awareness for Asteroid Day. And how good can that be? It's not a case of if, but when. And Space Monkey knows that. And we've got... Uh, what, Atlanta Scully Extra Large Files, huh? And Litza de la Porta's watching, and Tom Usack's watching, and Jonathan Ward's in North Carolina, and Jonathan's an astronomer. I'll bet he'll get out and look at the moon tonight. If it's clear, that is. Of course, that's always the caveat, is, is it clear? And but Jonathan Ward, author of some wonderful books, including one on Eileen Collins, Breaking the Glass Ceiling, and the definitive story you ought to read about the Columbia disaster, bringing Columbia home with Mike Leinbach, our good friend, uh, Jonathan Ward. So hope to see you in the Space Coast soon, Jonathan. And hope that you're going to tune in to some of the activities in Luxembourg on Asteroid Day, uh, as uh, I intend to. So, uh, Marty, thank you for a good Streamlabs show there. We we uh, don't want this to happen, but like I said, something big someday will happen. And hopefully we'll be ready to defend ourselves. Thanks again to GoHistoryTravel.org for their financial contribution that's helping us buy some new equipment to take Stay Curious on the road. And Marty, again, thanks. Glad to have you back in the saddle, my friend. And error-free Stay Curious today. So we're going to have some shows this week. Tuesday, we're going to talk about the shuttles of the month of June and put our cap on that. Wednesday, I'm going to catch you up on some space news of the day. And Thursday, we're going to have Terry White, our uh, 
shuttle garage expert and his son, Travis, who was watching our program while he was on duty in Iraq, and he's going to be deployed, I think, up to Alaska. Uh, so uh, we can't wait to meet Travis, and, and uh, we always uh, appreciate our military protecting us. And then Friday, we're going to have a future Friday with Via Space, our local 3D printed rocket company here in Brevard County. So hope that you make plans to either watch us live or check out YouTube as we have over 400 Stay Curious editions up there for you to watch. So until then, I'm going to say thank you for watching Stay Curious today. And I'm Mark Marquette saying I can't wait to see you like I did the Gerald's in our museum to bridge the space between us.